Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mary Woolley, the president and CEO of Research America. For more than 30 years now, the Research America Alliance has advocated for science, discovery, and innovation to achieve better health for all. That's what we all care about, and today's topic could not be more relevant. We call it a path to progress, perspectives on obesity research and treatment. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there are many health and medical conditions that are linked to obesity, including, of course, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and stroke, and much more. It's research that has revealed insights into the causes and the effects and the population considerations that are so important to informing treatment and prevention strategies. So before we begin, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsor, Novo Nordisk, and acknowledge and thank our partners, the Black Women's Health Imperative and the Portion Balance Coalition, as, which is part of Business for Impact at Georgetown University. There's a link in the chat to the bios for our distinguished panel. Our moderator today is Dr. Willie Prado, Vice Provost of Faculty Affairs, Dean of the Graduate School and Professor of Nursing and Health Studies, Public Health Sciences and Psychology at the University of Miami. And Dr. Prado is a Research America board member. Joining him on the panel today are Linda Goler Blog, President and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative, Dr. Barbara Hansen, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics and Director of the Obesity, Diabetes and Aging Research Center at Morsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida. And Dr. Hansen is a long serving member of Research America's Scientific Advisory Committee. Then we have Dr. Gerald Harmon, the 176th president of the American Medical Association. And Dr. Sarah Messiah, professor of epidemiology, human genetics and environmental center sciences and director of the Center for Pediatric Population Health at the University of Texas. And also Diane Tai, director of the Portion Balance Coalition at Business for Impact at Georgetown, the McDonough School of Business. Welcome to you all. Thank you all for joining us and take it away, Willie. Thank you so much, Mary, and good afternoon to everyone who is watching us. According to the CDC, the percentage of adults 20 or older in the US living with obesity reached 42.5% in 2018 and 73.6% were overweight, including obesity. Additionally, obesity prevalence in youth ages 12 to 19 is 21.2%. Individuals who live with obesity are at greater risk for many other serious chronic diseases, including severe illness and death from COVID-19. For example, 30% of adult hospitalizations due to COVID-19 that took place from the start of the pandemic through November of 2020 for people living with obesity. My fellow panelists and I have spent many years researching the science behind obesity and developing programs and treatments to reduce it. We have an even greater sense of urgency about the need to address this problem as we see how people living with obesity are negatively impacted by the COVID pandemic. Our research has shown that Latino and African-American communities experience significantly higher obesity rates than non-Hispanic whites which puts them at greater risk of COVID-19 and other conditions and diseases. The factors contributing to this are sensitive and complex. It is essential that we continue to build upon current research efforts to increase ways to assist those living with obesity, particularly given its disproportionate impact on racial and ethnic minority groups. Our wonderful speakers will explore the multifaceted challenge of living with obesity including its relevant to health disparities and the role of research, prevention, and treatment. So let's dive in. Gerald, let me start with you. Many people living with obesity do not regularly see a doctor for fear of being stigmatized for their weight, 
or having other medical conditions not be taken seriously with their weight. How can the medical system confront this? Is there a way to confront this to ensure people living with obesity have a full access to a continuum of care? How have you seen the medical practice change in this space since you started treating patients? Good question, Dr. Prado, and you're exactly right. One of the things we actually know as practicing physicians, and I'm practicing still in uh, rural South Carolina, I'll tell you that probably 40% of my patients are overweight uh, and just, uh, in fact, may even approach obesity numbers. So I see it daily in my, in my small town medical practice. But what we're trying to do is recognize, and the American Academy, uh, the AMA has recognized obesity is a chronic disease. It is a real disease. We've officially stated that. And we understand that one of the things we need to be careful about, and you bring it uh, clearly into uh, perspective, I want to make sure my patients who happen to have obesity as a disease state are not embarrassed and not stigmatized to come to see me. You're exactly right. And I've taught my medical students, my residents the same way. We need to establish that when people come to us that happen to have obesity as a comorbidity, that's not the cause of all their comorbidities. They have other issues. They're depressed. They have hypertension. They have other things. So what we need to be careful of is that our patients need to appreciate that we as doctors do not stigmatize them that your only problem is obesity and you just need to address that. We need to take them at more than just face value. We need to look into them, understand they're coming much as someone with a, a, a behavioral disorder, as a substance use disorder. You can't just stigmatize these people and, and, and these patients because they're not there just because of their obesity. We're teaching that in medical schools. We have a new board specialty called obesity medicine with several thousand doctors now being certified in that. We're trying to teach it in medical schools. It is an incredible cause of other diseases and certainly a contributor to social determinants of health and health inequities. So all of those things resonate with me. I could go on and on about it, but you're exactly right. One of the first things we as doctors need to understand is patients with obesity need to be destigmatized. Absolutely listen to them, ask what's going on. I've taught medical students and residents. They'll come in, they say, we have this morbidly obese patient. Nope, Tom, you have a patient that has an issue, whether it's chronic disease, hypertension, or diabetes, that happens to have morbid obesity as one of their co contributing factors. Let's go ahead and talk to it, get past it, and then help these patients so that they can feel comfortable that we have a two-line, two-way communication and not just one physician or healthcare provider, perhaps talking uh, in one uh, communication, top-down communi communication. It needs to be patient-centered. And that you, you, clearly this strikes a chord with me, so thank you. Thank you, Gerald, and I agree that that patient-centered approach and that bi-directional communication is, is absolutely key to the stigmatizing. Linda, Black Women's Health Imperative has done a lot of work to raise awareness about obesity, among other health concerns, through a lens of health equity. Social determinants of health, as Gerald was speaking about, such as access to healthcare, housing, education, food, and community have a huge impact on chronic conditions like obesity, particularly in certain minority populations. I realize this is a full-length question itself, but what more can we do to address these factors in America? Yeah, you're right. Your, your opening statement was, of course, dead on. It's, you know, the factors are complex. They're, um, you know, it's not, this is, obesity is not so straightforward as we used to think about it. And, and Dr. Harmon, I want to thank you for just putting the patient first and, and offering that we don't, we should not see the patient as obese. We should see the patient as a human being and who happens to live with, with obesity. But, you know, when we think about the, the disparities, so I, as you said, I, I spent a lot of time talking about obesity and overweight among black women, women of color. The thing is we have to look at this through a historical lens. We actually have 30 years of research that looks at the epigenetic expression of racially and gender mediated stress. And we know what that does to how disease presents, what it does for our risk for obesity. Go back to 1992, Arlene Geronimus talked about the allostatic load that black women experienced. Um, they, she called it weathering. We literally are aging faster. The black women's health study found a causal relationship between experiences of racial discrimination and weight gain. They found if you gave black women and white women the same high fat diet and, and same calories, black women were gonna gain more weight and gain it faster. If you gave black women and white women the same low fat diet, black women are gonna lose less weight and lose it more slowly. Down the street from me at Emory, Tanae Lewis 
uh, more recently found a causal relationship between experiences of racial and gender discrimination and changes at the DNA level, at the telomeres, which she found changes our inflammatory and metabolic responses, which raises our risk for obesity related um, diseases. So as we talk about the social determinants of health, the same racial and gender distress stressors that are responsible for all the are all of the social determinants of health. And, and in fact, you could I think you could argue that perhaps racism and gender discrimination are sort of the social determinants of health um, when it comes to, to black women and women of color. So what we're doing at, at BWHI is, is putting obesity in the context of the lived experiences of, of black women. We have to examine the history and help black women themselves understand what the drivers of obesity are. And our, our lifestyle change program funded by CDC is the top performing program they have because we first start with how does it feel to be a black woman or a woman of color in the society in this time? And then we go from there. So we let this question guide all of our program work, our communications work with providers and researchers to help them understand what behavior changes are needed to remove the stigma that Dr. Harmon talked about, to talk respectfully about prevention and to provide the best care to black women and women of color living with obesity. Thank you so much, Linda. And you raised something so important that I'd like to build on um, because you know this discrimination is an, such an important social determinant of health that creates um, such, such significant disparities, including in obesity. So Diane, let me turn over to you and build, that on a, um, build on that a little bit. Can you tell us about the Portion Balance Coalition and the Eat For Your campaign? What does it mean to account for individual nutrition needs and what systemic changes do you think should be made to ensure that all communities have access to the resources they need, such as healthier foods? Thank you, Willie, um, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, the Portion Balance Coalition is a multi-sector collaborative with more than 40 leaders representing public health, academic research, industry, community-based organizations, and government. We have a subset of our membership that forms our scientific advisory board, which includes researchers from Penn State, Duke, Tufts, Harvard, CUNY, NYU, UT Austin, Kaiser Permanente. We have the president of the New York Academy of Medicine and a representative from the um, American Academy of Preventive Medicine is poised to join. And so you ask why portions, why the focus on portions? There was a major study by McKinsey Global done. Uh, they analyzed 74 possible interventions to address obesity. Portion control landed at number one on that list. And it's certainly not a silver bullet, but it's a topic that really has galvanized this diverse group of players. We evolved away, away from the term portion control and expanded it to be about portion balance. And we define that as volume, size, proportionality, variety of foods, and then nutrient density, the quality. Our coalition officially launched in January of 2019, and we're focused on demand and supply side strategy. So Eat For You, and the tagline is Let Portions Be Your Guide, is our coalition's consumer education campaign. We just let, launched it in October. We were actually on course, um, a, a separate course of action when the pandemic hit. As you said, it shined a light on obesity as a risk factor for poorer outcomes with COVID-19 infection, and it magnified the increase in food insecure households. So Eat For You is our response to this challenge that our PBC members said to us, how can we make portion balance relevant to low income consumers? So research shows that people have a very hard time knowing the appropriate amount of food to serve themselves. And portions have grown up to 130% since the 1970s. This has occurred in parallel with the rise in the prevalence of obesity. So it's human nature to eat what's put in front of us. This has been studied intensely. It's called the portion size effect or PSC. Essentially humans just they tend to eat what they're served. We're being offered too much um, to support a healthy lifestyle and yet and not enough of the right kinds and combinations of foods and beverages. So Eat For You translates the portion balance framework. We use illustrations of our hands that are visually compelling images that reflect cultural diversity with a range of skin tones, ethnic food examples, budget conscious food examples. We provide practical tips to increase nutritional value of the foods and beverages, and we make the connection to the USDA MyPlate. So 
a full hand of veggies. It's like, that's the half a plate, you know, the cup panda here is a quarter. So it's very, very relatable. Our consumer research with um, low income consumers, snap ed recipients, snap ed educators uh, was very, very positive, very well received. And I think the unique thing about this campaign is we co-created it with all the members. So all these diverse voices of our coalition with snap ed educators, with consumers. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how the uptake is. Um, as far as systemic changes that are needed, we need to increase access to nutritious and affordable food, plain and simple. So for example, in DC alone, where I'm located, um, three quarters of the food deserts are in Ward 7 and 8 DC, predominantly a black population. Good Foods Market is an exciting solution. It offers fresh produce and groceries, prepared foods, community rooms for education and all. Um, that's just one step. And it's, it was, you know, it was the role of a social entrepreneur, my friend Philip Sambol, who launched these good food markets with a mix of private and public funding. We need more of that. Why is there a giant foods, you know, half an hour away by public transportation? We're having to create these, you know, solutions in our community. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Diane. And I, and I love the, um, the broad key stakeholder approach to the development of the campaign. I think it maximizes, um, you know, sustainability. So that's, that's wonderful. As someone who is overweight and obese for um, during my childhood and early adulthood years, I can certainly relate to the portion control as well. Um, I, I resonate with, with that reframe of portion balance. Um, I also, you know, family is so, so key and it's something that I also resonate with um, as an underrepresented minority um, where family plays a key role. And so Sarah, uh, this question is for you. It's, it's really difficult, um, if not impossible to speak about obesity in individuals without speaking about the family and the family context. And so I'm wondering if you can um, you know, respond to the question, what role does the family play? What have we learned about the role of the family in obesity and what else has to be learned? Thanks, Willie. And, and thanks for everybody for having me today and, and bringing up this really important topic. It, it is an inherent layer of challenge in pediatric obesity in particular in that we cannot isolate a child that has healthy weight challenges without bringing the family framework into it. So it adds a whole nother layer of complexity when we are designing interventions and especially with high needs families. What uh, I'm sure a lot of the physicians on the call can relate to is oftentimes in peace clinics, um, when we have identified a child with uh, overweight or health healthy weight challenges, uh, there's at least one parent that's facing the same issue. And oftentimes will bring up their own challenges in that pediatric appointment. And it's well known that the number one risk factor for a child to have unhealthy weight is to have one parent at an unhealthy weight. And that doubles when it's both parents. So obviously it's highly correlated and so when we're designing interventions for healthy weight in childhood, we have to always be thinking in the context of that family and household environment because children are dependent on their parents for the food choices that are coming into the household, whether it's food coming in, fast food choices outside of the home, physical activity, they're usually the source of transportation if they're going to be going by car to a physical activity and, and so on and so on. So to design interventions that are directed just at children is, is really, um, really short-sighted. So we constantly have to be thinking about the, the family context. Now, that being said, I, I can think of some other challenges that we've had over the years in, in some of our projects, namely, especially in young children, I'm talking like two to five-year-olds, and especially in some of our ethnic minority families, um, when a child is identified as having a healthy weight challenge, oftentimes a parent doesn't recognize it. And so how do you 
how do we start the conversation? Um, we had a USDA funded study in Miami for about a decade in preschools that served all low income families and 94% of families who had a child who was technically with obesity said their child was normal weight. And so how do you meet the parents in that conversation to start talking about what really is healthy weight? And so that is, it can be very culturally driven too. Um, and then of course the work that uh, done with Willie over the past several years targeting older children, adolescent Hispanic children, we found in that study surprisingly that a third of the parents qualified for bariatric surgery. So again, to my point of parents are really unhealthy too. We had, we had some parents that had extreme levels of hypertension too, you know, to the, where, to the point where we had to design protocols for referrals. And we didn't expect that at the onset. Um, of the study. So there are um, extreme challenges here, but um, I hold out a lot of hope too, in that it's an opportunity that we can address not one person, but several, if we're doing multi-level interventions to address this issue. So I think it's actually a really nice opportunity to, to think about lifestyle change within the family structure. Thank you, Sarah. We've talked about um, family and we've talked about social determinants of health disparities. I want to talk a little bit about now about the impact of COVID-19 on obesity. So Barbara, tell us a little bit from your research, how does living with obesity genetically, metabolically transition to comorbidities such as diabetes, heart disease, and so many others, um, including COVID-19? Well, um... Obesity has been my field of interest since I was born, I think. <laughs> Actually, I was at the University of Pennsylvania, and um, we were very concerned about how appetite is regulated. And the biggest problem of appetite regulation turns out to be obesity. And the biggest problem for obese people is diabetes. And so those spell out the areas that I have uh, spent all of my uh, career on. I, um, I got my first NIH grant after being turned down once. And my colleague told me all I had to do was delete the word obesity from the title and it would get funded. And I did, <laughs> no, actually I didn't. I, I was too proud of the word obesity to delete it, but I did make a few changes and got funded, I'm happy to say forevermore. But the real issue is stigma of obesity was huge that far back. And I regret to say that we really still have it as Sarah mentioned, and as um, Dr. Harmon mentioned, the stigma of obesity is one of our most devastating characteristics actually. It's, it's where we forget to realize that obesity is a biology. It's genetic, it's physiology, it's biomedical. And I have yet to meet ever an obese patient who wanted to stay obese. Some of you probably remember The Biggest Loser. Uh, I participated in a um, documentary that included him. And in that The Biggest Loser, he talked about the stress of trying to lose. He was the one that won, by the way but the stress of trying to lose all that weight, which took almost a year of heavy duty exercise and essentially starvation, <laughs> he was taking in so few calories. And in our documentary, which was called Fat, guess what had happened? He had regained all of his weight, every speck of it. So he was the winner. And if you go look at the history of those same contestants, the ones who didn't win, I'm sorry to tell you, they all regained their weight, most of them all the way after th two to three years. And so we have a problem that's clearly biological. It isn't bad habits. This man just pleaded at how hard he was working to try to not increase his intake and try to maintain his exercise, all the things he'd been told. So I think that 
uh, in the area of obesity and diabetes, we have to put a lot more emphasis on the underlying biology. And I think Dr. Harmon understands that, that the stigma of obesity is not the issue. These are not people who caused it themselves. <laughs> they are not people who wish to be obese. But they are people that have a biological burden, no question about that. And um, I guess I will talk a little bit later about the, uh, the kinds of biologic burdens that obese people are dealing with and where research is taking on those. I'll stop at that for now. Great. Thank you, Barbara. No doubt that biology and genetics and human behavior all interact um, in this, um, in this um, chronic condition. Gerald, next question is, is for you. Um, so you recently wrote a blog titled, Don't Socially Distance Your Doctor. Tell us how that pandemic has impacted the incidence of obesity. Is the pandemic impacting access to care? Do we have enough data to really understand how the pandemic has impacted obesity rates? Well, we don't, we don't have data that tells us how the uh, obesity, uh, how obesity has been impacted by the COVID pandemic. We do have data that how, shows how chronic disease, which frequently includes obesity as a substantial risk factor contributor to chronic disease, no question of it. We do know that patients have reduced access to doctors for a couple of reasons. One, they might be concerned about going to a healthcare facility because they don't want to get exposed to the COVID virus. They're worried about picking up uh, the, the coronavirus in, in, in a crowded environment like a doctor's lobby or a hospital emergency room or something like that. And unfortunately, we've had to reduce access because we've had with the COVID pandemic, uh, a, a, a multiple uh, factorial cause of patients not getting in because we've had COVID in patients, we've displaced chronic care. Sometimes we've delayed time sensitive surgery. We've had healthcare workers impacted also. So we have a workforce issue too, because the healthcare workers with the more in, uh, contagious uh, variants such as Omicron and our local hospital system, we usually have about, you know, maybe 30 or 40 pay, uh, providers out. Now we have 60 to 70 because of COVID precautions because they've contracted the disease. Despite the inf uh, influence of, uh, vaccinations, this still is a very uh, contagious environment. I will tell you that cancer, we have some studies from the American Cancer Society and Commission on Cancer, which I'm a member, that shows we have 10 to 20,000 more deaths in the next decade from cancers of the breast and colon because of delayed access to screening, surveillance, or interventions for cancer for those two diseases. So there is an impact on chronic disease. I would tell you that I think what we're, what we're seeing is not only a delay access, but we've also seen uh, um, probably a little more emphasis on COVID. It is a pandemic. We need to not forget that while COVID is certainly amongst us and, and, and the biggest headline every day, chronic disease has not taken a backseat. Chronic diseases of diabetes, hypertension, with 100 million Americans having prediabetes and 90% of those not even know they're prediabetic. They're not getting care. They're not getting diagnosed. They're not thinking about some of their chronic diseases. So we need to understand that when I say don't socially distance from your doctor, I mean, don't socially distance from the healthcare system. It's there to help you. And certainly those with obesity need to be among the front frontline recipients of healthcare. Thanks. Thank you. Diane and, and um, Sarah, this question is for both of you. So I'll let whichever one of you two wants to jump in first. Let's talk a little bit more about prevention and, and also treatment. What do we know about effective treatment and prevention? What tools do we have at our disposal to accelerate progress towards this vision of reduced obesity? I, I can go first. I mean, there's really no one size fits all solution. When we were determining who our target focus should be, we concluded that early adulthood is the important time to prioritize prevention. I mean, Sarah talked about that Obviously preventing childhood obesity is key, but children need parents who are attuned to healthy eating and young adults are gaining on average um, over a pound a year. So with 20 pounds on an average um, across 18 years of early adulthood. So we have to, we really have this mismatch in our biology and the environment. We, we gain weight and then it becomes that new set point and we receive signals, more hunger, less satiety, are more susceptible to reward eating. So we really need to look at the multiple settings, life events happening in early adulthood, and ensure incentives that are aligned for providers of food and beverages. 
pregnancy is one of those um, milestones. So it's wait, and we there's been studies that you know trying to break that intergenerational cycle of obesity uh, during uh, pregnancy is is not really been effective. We need to try earlier before pregnancy. But also just being housed in the business school at Georgetown, we see how industry must play a role and be part of the solution. So food manufacturers, they are reformulating, they're repackaging to improve nutritional value, um, reducing calories, offering smaller, smaller portions. They need to do more. We also believe that um, those that do will have their bottom lines rewarded. And um, you know, anyone who watches the football game, even just for half an hour, you're gonna see a lot of targeted advertising of energy dense, oversized portions. Um, and so, you know, how can we get restaurants um, competing less on volume? What if every restaurant in America offered their signature dishes and portions that are consistent with US dietary guidelines? They could still offer their core dishes, but could they also give the option of the same dish but in smaller portions. And we did a national survey and consumers are saying they would like restaurants to provide this option. So, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of success I think that we've seen, but there's a lot of great ideas for prevention. Thanks, Sarah. Diane. I can, yeah, I can speak a little bit on the, the treatment angle. Um, and, and to your question really about COVID impacting obesity rates, there, there has been um, a recent MMWR publication in a little less than a half a million children. It was a, a big payer database that showed that indeed children in the United States have gained a significant amount of weight just over the past two years. And unfortunately, the most impacted have been those children that were already with obesity. Uh, so we're, we were already challenged before the pandemic, but now it's just deepened this challenge. So um, it, it surely has had an impact there. Um, as far as treatment, there, there, right now um, there's two, and that's bariatric surgery and medication. And just also too, in the past few months, um, the FDA approved maglutide as a treatment option, but quickly because of supply chain issues and other things um, has now not been uh, equally accessed by all patients with obesity. So there's challenges there. Um, and bariatric surgery isn't necessarily an option for everybody either. Um, I, I've done a lot, I am doing a lot of work in that area in both adolescents and adults. And, uh, you know, I think the earlier points about the psychology of eating are fascinating because we can do the most extreme treatment in that we are doing, going in and doing a, a bariatric surgery. But at the end of the day, it's just a tool. And, and those health behaviors have to change uh, in parallel. So there, we do have treatment options, but um, there's challenges there too. There's no, there's no bullet. There's no one size fits all, so to speak. Um, and then finally, the combination of surgery and medication is sort of where we are right now in the forefront of, of research in that area. And there's no, there's again no answer there either. You know, some there's some in the field that are strong proponents for immediately prescribing medication after surgery to sustain the the positive weight loss, um, and then there's others that say no, um, wait and see how people uh, react to the surgery. So um, there's there are definitely options out there, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done, also. Thank you, Sarah and, and Diane, and clearly still lots of work um, to be done, as you said, and particularly how COVID has exacerbated um, you know, some of the problems that we have with obesity. I have a lot more questions, but there are so many valuable questions that are coming in through the chat in the Q&A feature that I'm going to turn to some of those um, now. So um, this question, actually, I'll, I'll let any, anyone that wants to take it. Um, any thoughts in ensuring that anti-obesity medications, 
apologies here. The chat is jumping all over because there are so many thoughts and questions coming in here. Um, so I'll take this one. Is yo-yoing worse than a consistent BMI? It may be that any duration of a healthy BMI is better than none. What does the research suggest? Well, I'll jump into that since my colleagues here have uh, hesitated a moment. Um, I think I started a few minutes ago mentioning how much weight regain took place for the biggest losers. And I think we have to understand that no matter what the treatment is, regain is always gonna be a risk. It's, it's apparently, as far as we can tell, part of the biology underlying uh, obesity. It's not going away. Uh, I will, I think later, make a comment or two about some of the research uh, frontiers, but certainly bariatric surgery is one area in the obesity research field that has made huge progress. I can, I can actually tell you the surgical procedure has changed so much in the last 15 years uh, with laparoscopic surgery and with multiple uh, improvements in the, in the surgical procedure itself. It used to be frightening to undertake and restricted to only, you know, really the most obese possible people uh, who were going to die if they didn't have the surgery. Mm. That is no longer the case. And the surgery um, is, is amazingly effective and really does help and does help for quite a long time. 10 years minimum, and after that, it really is a, uh, up to the patient. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I'm going to ask the next question. Um, why do the majority of people who have um, obesity develop hypertension and diabetes, especially in the African continent, where there are cases where the cases are most predominantly occurring? Hmm. I think you're tossing that one to me too, and I, not the minority part, but the other part, the, the why, why do they suffer from hypertension? And that's really biology. It's not bad behavior. It's um, obviously got some genetics involved. I have to say, we don't know the genetics yet. I wish we did, but we don't. We don't know the genetics for obesity either. I was alive and in the field at the time the leptin gene was uh, discovered or identified. And we all you know, said, hooray, we have the first real gene for obesity. And it didn't turn out that way. So I think we have to really think about how to make our treatments uh, more effective and prolonged. And that's really where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. This, I thought, um, you know, it's a very interesting question because it's a population that I think we don't um, speak sufficiently about. And the question is, how about maintaining healthy weight and what about obesity in people who have a disability, um, who have physical or um, some other type of mobility disability? You want to want to comment on that? It's a, it's a great question. I, um, we just started actually a, a study. Um, we were just funded by HRSA in Miami with preschool children with disabilities. Um, and unfortunately, because of uh, limitations to mobility, they're, obviously their physical activity is limited too. Um, but the other piece of it is oftentimes these children um, are rewarded with food for, for good behavior. And it's not it's, no, it's not to fault teachers or, or parents, um, but again, thinking like, why, why should children with disabilities not, um, not be a part of, of studies for healthy weight? And um, we've, we did studies in after school settings in Miami too, and found fantastic results. It's just thinking about modifying, especially children that may be wheelchair bound, um, you know, with severe limitations, they absolutely can participate in, in these type of programs. So, um, but I will say it's been a subgroup of, of pediatrics that hasn't received enough attention in, in healthy weight and their cardiometabolic health is often an afterthought after the, because of the disability being the central focus. So, 
um, I'm, I'm happy to see that that children with disabilities are now a part of the conversation more. It's been difficult to get to get work to get work funded in this area, um, but now I think finally maybe we're breaking through. And, and Willie, this is an interesting place where st st structures matter, the way things are organized. Obviously, in schools, you know, if schools still have resource recess, there's there's no one who very few people have the, the skills to help wheelchair bound kids or kids living with disabilities participate in cardio kinds of these um, activities. But this is true for adults. Obviously, very few gyms accommodate adults who may be adults who are living with disabilities to engage in cardio kinds of behaviors. But it's it's there was a study that was done years ago that looked at grocery stores and the the all of the calorie dense kinds of products that we might consider not terribly healthy you know, um, carbohydrate rich stuff is on the lower shelves. Well, if you're wheelchair bound, that's what you can reach. And so it, it almost becomes the way the system is organized that contributes to ob obesity and, and actually discourages the kind of behaviors that we're, we're talking about because facilities just don't accommodate people who might have mobility issues. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Linda. And you're talking about, um, you know, in some ways, um, you know, structural level interventions. And so let me ask a question that, that came in just a few minutes ago related to this theme of, of structural interventions. So the question, and actually it's for you, Linda, if racial discrimination is the quote unquote first order factor that leads to diseases comorbid with obesity and people with obesity often face discrimination because of their weight, would it be more impactful to address the root causes such as racism and social inequality than the correlational condition of obesity, especially when obesity interventions shift responsibility to the individual mm, and yeah. individual action? And, and that's a great question because when you put the burden on the patient, you increase the stress, which makes dealing with the obesity even more problematic. You know, the, the answer is let's deal with root cause. We, in public health, we talk about dealing with root causes all of the time. But of course, if we're going to really deal with the root cause, then we've got to deal with the, the history and how we got to where we are. We've got to deal with 400 years of, of racial oppression. We've got to deal with gender oppression. And, you know, honestly, this can be done. But this, this takes the will of people in power and the people with resources. And so far, we've not been able to galvanize that will, as someone said to me uh, not too long ago, it's not good for business. So if we, can, if we can actually turn being healthy into being good for business, if we could create those kinds of structures that you're talking about that incentivize the kind of behavior we're, we're interested in and disincentivize the behavior that perpetuates this, wonderful. But I think until we get to that point of making that really, or those really bold steps, we're gonna to continue to have these conversations and we're gonna tinker around the edges and put the, the burden on the individual. Yes, individuals have a responsibility to try to live a healthy lifestyle, but we know now with the way society and, and systems are organized, that's not always possible. I agree. Thank you, Linda. And Gerald, your, your hand came up as Linda was talking. What do you have to add? Well, to add to, from, to Linda's perspective as a public health expert, you know, I've got to put my little AMA commercial in here because it's important to me as AMA president. Our, our mission statement is to advance the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. Uh, we realize that in order to have betterment of public health, we have to address a multifactorial system to Linda's point of public health. So what we have done is uh, this past May, we introduced a, um, a health equity plan. It's the, it's the Embed Racial Justice and Events health, health Equity Plan that has five prongs to do things that we're discussing about right now. If we're going to raise the bar on health equity for all and address health disparities, we need to go to a, a, a deeper dive and find out what we can do. We have five components of our plan. First, we had to recognize AMA had a, a, a racist past, and we have to recognize that, and, and we have recognized it. We want to embed equity and, and, and racial uh, justice throughout the AMA itself. We want to foster pathways for truth, reconciliation, uh, and, and transformation for the AMA's past. 
we want to, we, we're working with stakeholders, other stakeholders, the National Medical Association, other uh, uh, marginalized physicians to work together and, and to improve health equity. We're going to build alliances with them. We're going to push upstream to a social determinants of health, to all of our concerns here that are, are there. And, and what we're trying also to do is make sure we have equitable structures as we move in innovation with new wearable technologies and new treatments. Let's make sure that all of that uh, uh, applies to communities of color and underserved populations. So we're really trying to do what you're saying. At the same time, we also have some things we can do now as opposed to three to five years in the future. That This is gonna to have to be a, a steady progress uh, taking this journey with a single step forward to do the things that I'm also hearing uh, to address blood pressure, to address diabetes, to recognize uh, obesity as a disease. Some of your questioners, and we, I, I don't have time to continue a soliloquy here, but somebody's asked about, can we get Medicare and Medicaid to pay for treatments for uh, obesity, such as surgery, medicines? Yeah, there's a uh, uh, an act in the Congress that's, uh, I think it's called the, uh, uh, let me see what it is. There's a, some act, uh, treat, obesity, treat and Reduce Obesity Act of 2021. It's still active, it hasn't passed, but it would help some of our, treatments get paid for by health insurance, by Medicare and Medicaid. And we as doctors, we, we'd love to be able to feel comfortable that we're doing the right thing and that our patient are put at substantial financial risk to get certain of these treatments. We know make a difference. I just point out, everybody I think is working towards a, a good goal of improving uh, uh, health equity and ending health disparity. And this, this is part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. So we, we've talked about. Can, um, I thank, uh, can I thank? Go ahead, Dr. please, Harmon, Barbara. For one thing. Sure. Um, Dr. Harmon, the AMA was one of the first organizations to declare that obesity is a disease, and it was a very difficult decision for your organization to make. I'm a member of the American Society Nutrition Society, and it's difficult for them to accept that you know we have to be recognizing the biological basis and the disease nature of obesity and contributing not only problems of obesity, but the clinical manifestations of other complications. So I would just say thank you to the AMA for allowing this to move forward to help people understand that obesity is not bad behavior. <laughs> it's not uh, poor education. It's, it's a lot of it great deal of it is the biology underlying it. And you made that so clear. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Diane. Yeah, so Barbara, building on what you just said in terms of biology being behind um, the obesity crisis, as you talk about the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, it's expanding Medicare coverage for intensive behavioral therapy for obesity. So I wonder how that fits in terms of then does that put then the, the burden back on the individual to change their behavior, their lifestyle? Or could you explain more what we're looking for in terms of the coverage for Medicare? You probably didn't know that my background is in both psychology and physiology. Got it, good. <laughs> you also can tell from what I've said so far that, that my orientation is not in the behavioral direction as a cause. And it has not been particularly successful right. producing long-term weight loss. It's been very effective short-term. But I wish I could say otherwise. It just hasn't been. And we, I think that's because we're still trying to unalign the causes. And the causes back some years ago were thought to be bad behavior. So it was very appropriate to try to teach better behavior. I. I don't think the majority of scientists in the field today believe that obesity is bad behavior. Right. So I think we need, to, we need to be revamping how we're approaching it, how we're treating it. Um, the portion control is one of the ways, uh, certainly that uh, Sarah, I think it was Sarah, Sarah mentioned, oh no, yeah, it was, no, Diane, sorry, Diane. It was Diane who mentioned that, and I think the, there are tools we can use for helping people. But I think we also need to understand that any one tool isn't gonna to be enough. Portion control is a great one. I strongly applaud and have known Barbara Rolls who initiated the whole portion she's, control move. She's on my advisory board and very active. I knew that was true because you named her university. 
<laughs> yeah, she she actually gave a lecture for my medical student class this past uh, month. So she's a, a great person. But even she will tell you that it's not the whole story. It's right. an aid. It's a piece. And that we really need to understand the underlying course of obesity. And clearly, this is a, a multi-layered um, condition that requires a multi-level approach. And it really is still lots of questions to be answered with a lot more research um, that needs to happen and a lot more great science. You know, we, we talked about interventions, both prevention and treatment. And I know that there's a couple of folks here that are gonna want to answer this question. Um, and the question from our audience member is, and I'm gonna add to this if I may, is we know that BMI is a apparently terrible measure of overall health. Why do we continue to use it as a marker of poor health when there are proximal measures of health outcomes? I'd also like to add to this that physical activity and diet are so important when we're talking about obesity and measuring those is particularly challenging with the different measures um, having their own potential limitations and challenges. So I'm wondering if somebody can comment about uh, you know, the measurement of BMI, physical activity, and, um, and diet. Well, BMI is easy. Um, it's, a, it's an easy calculation, not applicable broadly, and, and probably not terribly instructive, as I think a lot of folks who study this know. Um, you know, I think what the panelists are, are, are kind of getting at and, and thinking about, you know, Barbara, you're talking about biology, you know, we've got to come up with a different language. I mean, I appreciate the AMA destigmatizing this issue. You know, people who are living with obesity are still stigmatized, but we need to give the everyday consumer the language to use to understand what's actually happening, because most people don't. Just like we've seen this with COVID. I literally two weeks ago, someone college educated said, oh, it's just the sniffles. Like, how can you think COVID-19 is just the sniffles? But people don't really understand what obesity is and they don't understand it as a disease. And we really need to, to work to help people understand it and what it means for their own behavior. Because whether you have bariatric surgery or you're on medication, whatever it is, it still requires a lifelong commitment to changing your lifestyle. Otherwise, to Barbara's point, you, you kind of go back. So I, I, I would love us to get to understanding the why. Because you know, it may be a biologic response, but what we've seen with COVID-19, um, and I, I appreciate that there's no, been no study, but we've seen obesity rates increase, and they are increasing because people are self-medicating with food. We know that. And so even before COVID-19, we've got to get at the why. Why are people self-medicating through food? Why do we have several programs on obesity on television? My 600 pound life and the rest of them. Mm -hmm. We really need to, to peel back those layers and understand what is going on because it is, I agree, biology is a piece of it. But I dare say most of it has nothing to do with biology. It has to do with our view on life and how people are trying to deal with the messaging that they're getting about food, about health, about what's healthy. You know, we went through a, a long period where you could be healthy and overweight. I don't know if you remember that 10 years ago, there was a big movement there, yeah, maybe. Um, but the point is people don't know, and, and by people, I mean everybody, even physicians don't know how to have this conversation with, with the everyday person in a way that it can lead to behavior change. Thank you, Linda. Anyone want to comment on on the why? Why do we continue to be a, use BMI if it's not a great great measure, as, as has been shown in some studies? And is there something else that could be used, or should be considered in addition to or in lieu of uh, BMI? Well, I can comment on BMI because BMI has been in use for many years. Um, it's an easy measure, as um, Linda said. It's easy to do height and weight. And it can be done in every doctor's office. And you just look at a card and see what the BMI is and what color the background is for that particular number. So it's a facile way to get to an estimate. It's also not all that bad. I wanna say it's not all that bad. It, um, obviously there are people, weightlifters, for example, 
who, who have excessive weight relative to the rest of their body, doesn't pertain to them very well, doesn't pertain, by the way, to aging people either because they lose quite a bit of their muscle mass, but they keep fat mass, at least that's the tendency. And so it has areas where it doesn't function very well. But in general, it's pretty darn good for getting an idea of whether, in fact, a person is exceeding the most healthy weights and the weights for their height is what really, it's important to take height into account. And so that's what BMI really is about. It's a, it's a shorthand, but it is the best we have other than actually doing DEXA, which is measuring actual body fat. But I will say this, DEXA doesn't add much to the BMI. If you, if you have a high BMI, I guarantee you, <laughs> with very few exceptions, you're gonna have a high body fat mass. So I think we should accept that BMI is a good surrogate for actually doing a biological measurement of adiposity. It's not necessary to do that because the BMI does a very good job of correlating with that. Thank you, Barbara, yes. and thank you, Linda. And, and clearly, BMI is imperfect, um, but as you said, it's a, it's a good surrogate and it's, it is easy to, to obtain. Um, I, I know colleagues who do work in the area of obesity and how it intersects with depression. And so this question came from one of our audience members, and I think it's, it's a very important one. Um, could the panelists comment on the contribution of antidepressant and antipsychotic drug therapy to the obesity problem as a whole? And how do you approach this problem in specific patients? I don't know. Dr. Harmon, do you want to start? Dr. Harmon, you yeah, want I'll to go start? ahead and take ownership. As a family medicine doc, clearly I've had this. Uh, it, you probably not, uh, the patients come in and, and many patients will come in uh, with, with similar c concerns as, as that you just voiced, Willie. I tell you, what, what I've seen, and, and this, is, this is the old two-edged sword that I face as a primary care doctor, uh, not a behavioral health specialist, not an OBC medicine specialist, but many of my patients may have a need for pharmacologic innovation, uh, intervention, prescription for whether that's anxiety, situational depression, uh, anxiety, depressive disorder, any number of behavioral uh, uh, health diagnoses where clearly in addition to getting them counseling or, or expert help from a psychiatrist, in many places in small town America, like where I live, I don't have a psychiatrist within an hour's drive of my patient population. So I've benefited just as a side note with telehealth and digital health consultations. But a lot of first line treatments that we might use in, in physician's offices might involve one of these medications that has as a side effect, uh, perhaps weight gain. We have to deal with it. And, and I will be very honest when I prescribe it to my patients, I'll say, you may notice, and I've got to tell you, I always have to give them some advice uh, about complications, whether it's a reaction. And I may mention, you may lose, gain a little weight, but I would suggest that you'll feel good enough about it. Then we can talk about ways to modify your behaviors as your biology changes a little bit and expect that and, and lay the groundwork up front so that the person doesn't become more discouraged or more anxious because they will gain some weight. I've told them they may, and then we can address it later on. I don't think that that pro prohibition or the concern about the side effect of weight gain would prohibit me from prescribing the medicine up front. However, that is a thoughtful concern that I wish all of us as doctors can think through. And we prescribe these medications. The side effects can lead to weight gain, can lead to another disease that it, in some ways can compound the primary disease or replace it. Uh, a very good point by your questioner. Uh, it's a complex answer, but as long as we, and I've educated, and we're, I'm working at educating physicians in my day-to-day -day practice, when you prescribe these medications, think about the side effect on their on their lifestyle. It's gonna have an impact. And as long as we prepare them, it's part of shared decision-making. Very complex answer, but it was a complex question. Thank you, thank you, Gerald. I, I see where we only have about 10 minutes left. And I wanna say thank you to all who have submitted questions. These have been such great questions and I apologize um, that we were not able to get to all of them, but I would please encourage you to follow up. I'm sure all of our panelists here um, would appreciate an email or two from our fellow audience members and would be very happy to, to answer some of your questions. Final question I have, and this one is um, you know, for each one of you, and maybe in a minute and a half, 
um, to two minutes. Can you tell us what's on your short-term wish list? How can research move the needle on the obesity epidemic in 2022, especially in populations such as African-Americans and Hispanics facing higher rates of obesity and threats from, from COVID-19? And actually, Gerald, you're still in front of me on my screen, so I'll just start with you because of that. Same answer I've given before, and I think you've heard from many other panelists. We need to address as a societal, as a structural uh, deficit. It's structural racism, structural bias, whatever you want to call it. We're not going in about it deliberately. Uh, we as a society don't say, well, how can I harm uh, black patients, brown patients, na uh, Native American patients? How can I do something today that would be adverse to health? No one does that deliberately, but we have a structural situation that tends to unfortunately disproportionately affect folks that have had, it to, to the other panelists' point, centuries of, of structural uh, uh, dysfunction. We need to get to the root causes. We need to address the social determinants. I know this that's not an immediate uh, change, but we need to address that with some sense of urgency. So that's what I'm trying to do as a family medicine doc, as AMA president, and as a practicing physician. I think all of us need to address that as a public health emergency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Sarah, what's your perspective? What's on your wish list? I'll put on my public health hat and, and just talk about prevention and it can't start early enough, but there's lots of studies even in pregnancy now and talking about um, pregnancy influences on uh, potential obesity later in life. So I think, um, and we know too that obesity tracks strongly from childhood into adulthood. So I feel like the prevention cannot start early enough. Um, I, and I really think um, we need to back it up into preconception, conception, pregnancy, and then track children strongly in parallel with their families throughout childhood to really, really learn more about this interaction um, between epigenetics, environmental influences. It, it's really complex as everybody has pointed out today. That's that's sort of the elephant in the room is that it's not a, it's not a simple solution. That's why we're what, going into our fourth decade of this, this epidemic. It's, there are no easy solutions. And today's panelists have been excellent in bringing up all these different layers of challenges that I frankly, I think have really come to the surface over the past couple of years too. Um, and they need to be addressed and they haven't in research surrounding causes of obesity um, traditionally, I would say. So um, I, I definitely think we need to be thinking more along those lines. Thank you, Sarah, appreciate that. Barbara. Well, I think one of the things that's happening at least in the biological side is to notice that there are really a lot of risk factors beyond what I would call the traditional risk factors. And I think we're beginning to look earlier and earlier in the path from the beginning, you mentioned childhood, childhood or wherever obesity begins to develop, what are the pathways that are leading to sustained obesity? And from my vantage point, we need to understand a lot more about those causal mechanisms. What is pushing this epidemic? And certainly psychosocial aspects you know, are contributing, but uh, the number and mass of people, not just in the United States, by the way, this is not an American problem. If you thought it was, you're wrong. <laughs> it's not an American problem, though it is an American problem. It's not unique to us by any means. And we really do need to keep pushing forward on research, research to understand what actually underlies the development of obesity, why it's so irreversible or when it is reversed, why regain happens and how can we better prevent it in the first place. So I think those are all major focuses for our biomedical as well as psychobiology uh, research. Thank you so much, Barbara. Diane. So I think um, I'm probably ending up where Sarah is as well. I think it affected uh, Preventive weight gain in young adults may reduce the likelihood of obesity developing in spouses and children. 
And so a longitudinal study over index for strong participation um, of black and Latino families that really links um, weight changes and parents and their children could really demonstrate that a family-based weight control strategy is needed and benefits both. Also the relationship in terms of our, our gut health and our brain health is really key. Um, in addition to my role at Georgetown, I'm a, a director um, for the Alliance to Improve Dementia Care at the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging. Obesity is, um, as, as well as diabetes, are risk factors for dementia. Um, and I guess lastly, related to all of this, um, I think Dr. Hammond, you, you mentioned um, the use of apps and digital tools. Um, I think those could be incredible tools for families to receive education, set goals, track their success, but they need to be validated with research. Thank you. And last but not least, Linda. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot here. Um, we need research. I don't know that we need more health disparities research. I think we, we know the differences. We need to understand why. That's, that's where we need the research. We need to incorporate social history into medical training, into clinical research, into therapeutic development and practice to actually understand, you know, we know obesity is not merely a self-control issue, but that for some populations, our bodies are literally responding to present day stressors that are hundreds of years in the making. You know, we need to look at quality measures. Wouldn't it be interesting if there were heatest measures by race and ethnicity around obesity and outcomes and that was tied to reimbursement. We need to look at the role of media and messaging again and what people actually hear and understand and talk to them in a way that we provide everyone actionable information, not just those patients living with obesity, but their providers and researchers as well. We need to pass the TOIA Act. <laughs> that, that would help um, because that does expand more access to obesity treatment facilities and, and people, providers who can provide it. And I would say, you know, we're, we're a partner with one of the sponsors, uh, Nova Nordisk, and have a program called Reclaim Your Wellness. What we really need is a massive, probably decades long marketing campaign that's probably multi-billion dollars in size to combat the marketing of all of the food products and approaches to eating that have helped us get to where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You know, I've, I've enjoyed the last um, 67, 68 minutes or so, and I've learned so much from you all. And, and, and I've heard some important themes such as, you know, there are no easy solutions. We need to try to understand, um, you know, some of those risks, and I would say protective factors as well. Um, and we really need to continue sort of to build the science on, on prevention and, and treatment. It has really been such a pleasure and honor speaking with all of you about this such, you know, really such an important topic. Again, thank you to our sponsor, our sponsor Novo Nordisk and Partners Black Women's Health Imperative and the Portion Balance Coalition at the Georgetown University Business for Impact. Thank you all for joining me today, for joining our stellar panelists. I give you a virtual round of applause. And um, until next time, stay well, everyone.